Thank you very, very much, guys, for joining us here. We're all excited to have Mark do this awesome clinic. And I just have a couple questions for you, Mark. First, thank yeah. you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, so first question I want to ask is that uh, you, Misha, and Jake have had a lot of influence on young players, like many of the guys here. So uh, what would you suggest for intermediate and, and beginning players? What kind of technique to focus on, and what do they not need to pay attention to as they grow as guitarists? Um, I mean, it's really hard to say that you shouldn't pay attention to something as a as a True. aspiring musician. But I, I would say to start recording yourself as early as possible, because that was the point in my sort of formative years on the guitar where I learned a lot about what I was good at and about what, most importantly, I really sucked at. Uh, and so once I identified those things, then I could go back and work on them. I could hone in on those things and uh, and basically get better one by one in each one of those things. But I mean. You guys know this. Record yourself, right? You're going out. Everybody has GarageBand on their, on their freaking iPad and computer these days, so you can do it very easily, and learn to double track yourself. Learn to play along to your right side after you've recorded your left, and vice versa. And you can hear a lot about your playing, good and bad. Uh, so as long as you're comfortable with the truth, uh, yeah, that's. I think that's that's probably the most important thing that I ever did as a, as a musician was learning to track against something, against a click track, against a drummer against myself. Um, so yeah, that's probably priority number one. Right on. Now, uh, another uh, question on songwriting. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for balancing uh, any technical aspects of a song versus just the musicality and melody? I mean, I would say never let technicality sort of lead the charge when it comes to writing a song. Never, I mean, at, at least in my book, I've heard a lot of music that you can tell that the whole intent of the song was just to be technical. And there are really cool examples of that, but periphery is not that. Um, and while there's a lot of technicality in our music, it never ever is at the forefront of it. I, I never want that to be number one about our music. Um, that just happens as sort of a symptom of who we are as musicians individually. Um, I like noty complex music, uh, but I wanna write songs. You know, and that comes first and foremost, and especially in a band context, we need to write songs that we feel flow well. Uh, and then the technicality just sort of shines through uh, because that's who we are as musicians, because we like to sort of expose that sides of ourselves. So uh, are there any bands, any guitarists you could point to that really first sparked that, uh, uh, that kind of playing in you, that, that technically proficient yeah, sort of I mean, playing? The first time I heard uh, Pantera, I mean, no, I mean, for, back to Metallica, because those were songs, right? Like Metallica, especially in the 80s, they wrote real, real, real songs, but you could still hear it like, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. And James Hetfield was doing this crazy right hand stuff, all downstrokes. Um, so it even goes as far back as Metallica, but that's always been my favorite kind of band, is bands who write songs, but you can hear the musicianship behind the songs. The musicianship is not what you hear first. I don't really like that in a lot of music, and it's why... It's why I think I lost, I lost a lot of patience trying to be a guitar hero when I was a teenager. I used to want to be Steve Vai, I used to want to be Joe Satriani, I used to be want to, want to be one of these guys, um, but I didn't really have it in me. Uh, not only was did I realize it wasn't my taste, but I can't do that stuff. <laughs> um, and I think it takes a very specific type of musician to be able to accomplish that stuff. Um, but for me, it's songs first. Songs, and if you want to be technical, it's just sort of, Lay that under there. Devin Townsend's another big one. <laughs> Devin Townsend. For sure. Very, very, very talented guy. Yeah. Now, a question about your amp rig. Uh, you use on tour and in the studio uh, Fractal Audio Axe Effects, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, can you tell us any advantages and disadvantages of going to that sort of uh, really high-def modeling setup versus playing with a tube amp like the Paul Reed Smith Archon you got behind you? Well, this, I love this because it's just, it's bare bones and it's simple and there's no interface, there's no buttons to push. You just plug it in. I walked in here 25 minutes ago and I, and I dialed in a really, can I do that? Absolutely. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I dial in a really ballsy <laughs> Sounds like Cannibal Corpse, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just walked in and I, I, I put everything at noon and I plugged in a, a little uh, 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 Horizon Precision Drive pedal here that I use as a tube screamer to sort of push the amp a little bit. Um, and that's what I got. 
So you can never go wrong with that combination. It's not even a combination. It's just a sick amp. <laughs> um, it's just a good amp. And, of course, the pickups uh, and the guitar, they do all the work, too. But, uh, I mean, I will never stop loving tube amps and the, the, the sound of a real amp. But for us, uh, the Axe Effects is sort of synonymous with periphery, with periphery and, and the way we write songs. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have actually seen us live. Actually, can I get a, a, a hand count for those of you who have seen it? Wow, so not even that many of you. Okay, so a couple. Of course you guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I knew it was going to go there eventually if I asked that question. Um, where was I at? Oh, so the Axe Effects in our live rig has all of our presets changing automatically. So there's no pedal boards on stage. There's no tap dancing. Uh, and the way we do that is we hook our Axe Effects directly into our MacBook Pro, which runs on a Pro Tools session. And the Pro Tools session houses Matt's click track, our drummer's click track, so we can hear what's happening in his ears at all times. Uh, we get click track, we get each other in our ears, uh, and it's all powered through the MacBook Pro. Just as importantly, we have a MIDI lane in the Pro Tools session that has little triggers that we program that, we, that sort of tell the Axe Effects when to switch patches. Um, so with just that technology alone, we kind of need the Axe Effects to be able to run our live show. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing piece of gear. It really is. I mean, once I bought an Axe Effects seven years ago, I, uh, I stopped doing the whole amp search, which made me broke in college. <laughs> um, you know, spending $3,000, $4,000 on an amp. That's a big thing when you're, you know, when you're a teenager. I'm sure you guys can all attest to this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the Axe Effects is, is, is just is wonderful. It's perfect for what we do. It also makes for a nice, clean stage setup, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Our roadies love it. <laughs> so uh, one last question. Uh, your Paul Reed Smith uh, SE model has been incredibly popular for us, a big seller. If you were to redesign and do, say, like a version 2, or w what would you want on an alternate version of your signature guitar? Nine strings. Nine, no, yeah. <laughs> You're great, going straight high on fire on everybody, Matt no. Pike style. Um, I don't know, man. I, I mean, I don't really know. The locking, I would have, because I have locking tuners on my home uh, signature model, the one I keep at home, the one I take on tour. That's the only thing I changed uh, from this model. So maybe I would have done that. But again, it's not, I don't feel locking tuners are necessary unless you're actually taking it out on stage, taking it on the road. Um, I'm on far stage right, so if you're watching a periphery show, I'm right over there, and Jake's here. So I'm like constantly banging into Jake. Um, <laughs> and that's what kind of why I need the locking tuners, uh, gotcha. just, as, you know, just to be a good bandmate. Well, makes sense and very courteous. Well, I won't take up any more of the clinic's time. Thank you very much, man. Thanks for having me. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Yeah. This is awesome. And, uh, you know, I know it's a, f it's, a f it's a free event. Right? Nobody paid to get in here, right? Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, but thank you, nonetheless, for spending your Friday nights here in a music shop. This is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome to be hanging out in a music shop after business hours, you know? Um, but again, I, I really appreciate you guys coming out and doing this and, you know, and being part of this. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty different thing, as you can imagine, from what a periphery show is. Because a periphery show is very one directional. It's just us playing music and you guys listen. And then good night, see you later. Um, where this, I like to do it completely differently. Where I will play songs for you guys, we'll play a couple tunes. Um, but I do this to sort of... So I'm curious too, I'm curious about you guys. What do you guys want to know? I don't want to sit up here and talk about random stuff because I could do that for a long time. Uh, about really dorky stuff that 90% of you probably don't care about. Or maybe you do. I can talk about scale length, I could talk about the fretboard radius, I could talk about body woods, I could talk about the pedals, whatever. Um, but I want to know what you guys want to know. Uh, and that's what sort of drives this. Uh, we did a wonderful clinic last night in Tucson, Arizona, and we had a really talkative crowd. But I've done some other ones where everybody was shy. They had questions before the clinic and they had questions after the clinic, but nobody wanted to talk during the clinic. I'm like, well, this is how we get a dialogue started. So, so what I'm going to do is, is basically just explain what I play. I'm sure you guys have questions about that. I'll explain what I'm using gear-wise, um, play a couple songs, but as we go along, 
please don't consider yourself rude if you want to ask a question. Just raise your hand and ask a question. So, uh, already, already, okay, 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 we, we can start. So, off the bat, you said 10 characters. Yeah. So, groove. Groove. Yeah, oh, yeah. But that's just, that's. For me personally, I, I always like groove, but be, because I always like drummers too. There's a lot of guitar players who don't care. Sorry, I feel like I'm about to go on a long diatribe right now, but I'll try and keep it. Um, no, I mean one of the one of the most important things I did was like I think the second year of my playing, I jammed with a drummer, and that was such an epiphany. That was such a revelation for me because I was like, wow, I really suck at playing to something, you know? Because I never played to a click, I never played to a drummer. But once I did, I kind of understood what drums did in the context of two people jamming and how you're supposed to follow a drummer. Um, and, uh, and for me, I always just had a profound interest in drumming and drummers. And I know a lot of guitar players who don't care about it. But so I've... would you say percussive? Yeah, I mean, writing with drums in mind. Uh, I, I would say writing, imagining a drum beat happening under your riff or under your part can make you a little bit more imaginative. Because I tend, I've tended to overwrite in the past. I'll write this really crazy stuff and not even think about the drums, you know? But you don't need to write so much if you have in mind what's happening in the context of the whole band. Uh, and again, back to what you were saying, it's groove. groove. Groove is essential to what we do. In my opinion, it's essential to anything that sort of has any weight to it, you know? I mean, Meshuggah are kind of the godfathers of that sort of thing, right? Extremely technical, but just the grooviest thing on the planet. Um, okay. <laughs> well, we'll look. Okay, well, okay. Well, because they just call them power Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were the originators, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess before we go into it, um, for anybody who's curious as far as what I'm playing today, I have uh, a guitar that I literally just picked up off the wall here. This is the, the 2017 uh, PRS SC signature model, uh, which is the same one that we put out last year, which is the updated headstock logo. And uh, this guitar was based off of the 2015 core model. Do you guys remember that one? Um, it was sort of, sort of similar, had a carved top, figured top, similar to some of the other US made PRSs here. Um, but it was expensive. <laughs> it was a pricey guitar, and I remember Hearing the reviews of the guitar, because as much as I hate to read reviews of stuff that I'm attached to, I do it, because I'm an idiot. Um, and I went online, and I saw all the reviews, and they were awesome. But then I would see other reviews be like, why is it $4,000, you know? And uh, I, I got in contact with PRS, and they had already been thinking along the same lines. Let's release this guitar, this $4,000 2015 US-made PRS. Let's strip away all the unnecessary stuff. Let's strip away what makes the guitar so pricey aesthetically uh, and just condense it down to the most important specs. And the most imp important specs on this guitar, head and shoulders above everything else, is the scale length and the fretboard radius. Uh, and the scale length is essential for me and what I do with periphery because we tune pretty low. Um, this, is our, this is our highest six string tuning. It's our highest one. That's a C. That's a C. Dropped C. Right. So everything's down a whole step. Six string is down to C. Um, and it, that really doesn't even sound that great, in my opinion, on a shorter scale length than that. But it really gets dicey when you go down to drop A or drop B flat, um, which we do for songs like uh, The Bad Thing, uh, B flat for Total Mad. Um, and some other ones. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but again, it's just a, that's that's the highest tuning in that in Haunted Shores as well is, is C. So we need a scale length that can accommodate C at the absolute highest. But as soon as you start to go lower than that, you're going to need something more than 25 inches. So when we made the guitar, that was spec number one. Spec number two was the fretboard radius. Um, can someone tell me, any PRS expert in here tell me what the scale length is on most PRS, or sorry, what the curvature, what the fretboard radius is on a PRS? Ten. Is it 10? Yeah. Okay, so it's 10. So that, so when someone says fretboard radius, it's referring to the, uh, the curvature uh, of, of the fretboard. Um, 
sort of like the radius of a circle. When someone says a 10 inch radius, it's a 10 inch circle. Uh, so they're taking a portion of that circle and making it the curvature of a fretboard. Mine is 20 inches. So that would be a pretty damn big circle compared to 10, which makes the top of it pretty flat. Um, and that was the intention with the development of the guitar. Um, I always liked the way classical guitars felt. Um, sort of had no, no resistance up and down, and that makes doing vibrato, at least for me personally, as a player, pretty effortless. I've just gotten used to the feel of bending and applying vibrato with just as little resistance as possible. So that's why we went for the 20 inch fretboard radius. And as far as I know, I don't think there was another PRS that offered that, and certainly not one that offered those two specs in the same guitar. Um, but that's, that's about it for, for the guitar. I mean, the Seymour Duncan Alpha Omega pickup set is in there. We had to have that. Um, had to have that because it's my favorite pickup set ever built on the face of the earth. <laughs> um, I, I developed this with a guy named Keith Merrow. Do you guys know a guy named Keith Merrow? Okay. It's an amazing seven-string guitar player, songwriter. Um, he and I just spent a couple days in, in, uh, in Santa Barbara um, demoing pickup sets, and it was one of the coolest experiences of my entire life. Uh, we would just build... We, we wouldn't do the building, but we would have the main builder upstairs build us a set of pickups. We'd get the pickups delivered downstairs in the Seymour Duncan studio, and then we'd demo it on a, on a clean toe. And then on a heavy tone. And then on a lead tone, and then a tele tone, and then a coil split tone, and so on and so forth. And every single time we did this, we would write down what we liked and what we didn't like about the pickup set in these really kind of layman's terms adjectives. Um, and then we would just send the list back upstairs. And then two hours later, we'd get another set of pickups. Uh, and so uh, you could probably imagine where this goes. It's just a lot of dorky pickup stuff for, for three days. And it was, it was really fulfilling because it opened my mind uh, as far as what pickups should be. Um, for instance, the goal with the pickup set was just to accomplish what you guys have been hearing. Is this. <laughs> you want that, I call it, it's a caveman sound, right? It just sounds like like a caveman with a turkey leg in his hand. Um, maybe not. Um, but that's the sound. And you can get that sound with a lot of pickups. Like a lot of pickups do this. Um, but what you lose with some metal pickups, no names, so I'm not going to name any names. Um, is once you start using some bigger chords, you start to lose a lot of the voicings. You start to lose a lot of the content that makes the chord cool. So what's the point of doing a big bright chord if you're not gonna hear any of the notes? Um, so with this, with this pickup set, especially with the bridge pickup, um, the Omega, we wanted this, but we also wanted this. how the notes still pop out, even though I'm on the same exact guitar tone, same exact pickup configuration. I wanted that sort of duality with it. Um, and then the other huge thing for us was, was this, was just having a very clear clean tone. I got a, a ton of effects on there, but here, let me take it off for a second. So 
very clear sort of luscious clean tone as well. Um, and um, that, that pickup uh, configuration is actually uh, coil split. So middle pickup selected uh, and then the uh, coil split engaged. So that's what that sound is. Uh, you had another question. Actually, can I get the gentleman behind you first and I'll go look? Yeah. PRS, uh, for me, the fascination with them came when I saw the movie Airheads. Uh, you guys remember the movie, Brendan Fraser and Steve Buscemi, and where they rob a, uh, they, they take a radio station hostage? Um, and Brendan Fraser says in the movie, he says, I want a PRS guitar with a dragon inlay. And I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and Google doesn't exist yet, but I'm going to find out what that is. <laughs> Because uh, this was in the mid-90s, so I was like, a PRS dragon in my PRS dragon in And I walked into a store one day. It was actually West Hollywood. I walked into a music shop there, and I see uh, this ridiculous private stock on the wall, and it had the dragon on the fretboard, and I was like, that's what Brendan Fraser was talking about. <laughs> uh, $10,000. Yeah, not for me. Um, and then that's when I sort of begun this, wow, PRS. But the the... I guess it's a fetish, right? I guess the fetish that's, uh, that began then was always one of like, I can never afford that. You know, I can never afford it. It's, it's this high unattainable guitar that I could never afford as a teenager. But I always kept it in the back of my head. And for years, even in periphery, I played a bunch of different stuff. Um, but it came when I actually met Paul. Uh, I met Paul Reed Smith at NAMM, I think four years ago, five years ago. Um, and we were talking about guitars. It's just a very casual conversation. And if any of you have ever met Paul or watched an interview with Paul, uh, he's very passionate about things he cares about. And I respect that uh, because I'm somewhat of the same way. And we just, he, he said, hey, what, what happens if I build your guitar? Let's just, you know, let's do that. Uh, and yeah, I, I said, yeah, well, let's, let's do it. Let's change some things, you know, let's, let's do the fretboard radius. Let's just try the scale length. And he said, let's do it. And a couple months later, I had the prototype for the core model. And I loved it so much. I was like, just give me this. I want nothing but this. Just give me this. Um, and then we, we just made it official. And then he said, well, let's try releasing it to the public. And then it was kind of kind of easy from there, you know. Um, but PRS has always just been the, the epitome of attention to detail, you know. And that's the reason that's the reason you love a piece of gear, because it sort of speaks to you on those levels. You don't want to buy something and have it be poorly made or or not exactly what you paid for or any of that stuff. There's so much gear out these days that if you pick up a subpar guitar or a subpar piece of gear, there's no reason to settle because there's 10 guitars right next to it that will satisfy that, you know? So um, anyways, that's kind of the story. Yeah. Uh, I saw another hand up. Is your hand up? Yeah. Uh, I have 11 of 56s on this. Diodario NYXL is my go-to. Um, yeah, I just I, I like thicker strings, especially for playing live because I pick really hard, um, especially live. I'm always always setting my strings sharp uh, when I play lighter strings. So I switched to heavier gauges just so I could uh, not have that happen so much. Yeah, I'll take one more question and I'm gonna actually just play a song for you guys. Yeah. Oh, it change. I changes changes from time to time. Um, lately, I've had just a custom 24 in my living room, just just the standard, uh, nothing custom about it, nothing private stock about it, just a custom 24 uh, that I, I freaking love. There's, a, I, there's an acoustic that I've been playing, because PR sent me an acoustic a couple months ago that uh, I've been practicing and writing a lot on acoustic. Um, yeah, it, it kind of just changes. Sometimes it's this. Um, it just, yeah, changes. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to play a song for you guys. This is um this is the lowest six string tuning that we have. This is drop A. So what that allows you to do is uh, sort of fret a power chord and have it sound like an octave. And for us, that produces a lot of really interesting relationships, um, especially when it comes to building chords. 
because you can now have this really drony, thick octave sound. <laughs> build chords on top of it. I'm going to play a song called Prayer Position for you guys. Um, I, I made a mistake earlier. I, uh, I changed the volume on my phone for the track, so this could blow all of our ears out. Uh, I just want, let me, let me test it out really quick, okay? Can I do that? Okay, just pretend this conversation isn't happening, everybody. Okay. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay, and unmen and black yourselves right now. Okay, okay. Okay, this conversation's now happening. Okay. So here's a song called Prayer Position.
Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's a fun, fun song to play. <laughs> it's on autopilot now because we've toured so much playing that song. But um, you guys know that we lost a bass player? Yeah. We are now officially sans bass player. Um, and it's a long, long story, and we'll be here till 1030 if I tell the whole story. Um, but yeah, he's a dickhead. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> No, 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 Nolly, Nolly is one of the best dudes on the planet. <laughs> I feel like I got to come back really hard the other way <laughs> now. He's he mother. Lived in a lot of production. Sorry? He had a lot of production. Oh, yeah. I mean, so first of all, for anybody who's curious, um, Nolly left because he didn't really like touring anymore. Uh, and that's why, if you've come to see us any time in the past year and a half, uh, he hasn't been part of the live show. Um, and he sort of felt that he just needed to step away in an official capacity. Um, but man, over the years that I was in a band with Nolly for I think five, six years, um, I learned so much from him. First of all, he could shred all of us under the table. Um, he's an amazing guitar player. He's got the most immaculate set of ears too. Uh, he's an incredible engineer and uh, he's just a great teacher. And if you ever YouTube Nolly Get Good, you'll see just how great he is in explaining things and taking these really intricate concepts and ideas and putting them into idiot terms. <laughs> like, you know, so stuff that I can understand easily. And, um, you know, I, I'm indebted to Nolly forever for, for what he taught me being in the band. Um, but I bring him up specifically because he was sort of the engine that, that drove that song, Prayer Position. Um, and it started with that riff. You guys know that first riff in the song is. We were starting uh, the recording, or we were finishing the recording sessions for Periphery 3. And we had 10 songs. And we were like, okay, I think this is going to be the album. Uh, and it felt pretty finished to me. I, I thought maybe we could go with 10 songs and have, still have it be a good album. Uh, so we were just working on random stuff in the studio and I we all hear Nolly Jam in this this uh, this riff. Sorry. just messing with that in the living room we we're like we got to turn that into a song um, and that song prayer position was kind of one of those those moments where Nolly has a riff and nothing else and then someone else has a riff and then nothing else and we just sort of ride each other's creative momentum and 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 take the song wherever it may go but that happens so much in our band where somebody has one idea that's so undeveloped and that's so primitive that nobody really knows where to go. But I have to say the beauty of having band members that write, and every single one of our band members writes music, is that if you're struggling, you can sort of rely on them to pick you up. Um, and this is the reason I always say, like when, I, when I meet people in, in up and coming bands or who, who aspire to be in bands, I always say, sort of, are you inspired by the people around you? Even if they don't play the instrument that you play, are you inspired by your drummer? Are you inspired by your singer? Because if you're not, then there may be something wrong there. Um, and at least for me personally, it was really cool to see that song come together because Nolly had a riff, and then Misha had a riff, and then I had a riff, and then Jake had a section. And we just sort of tag teaming and see, seeing who could, who could add on to the song. And all of a sudden, we, we had a finished song. Um, all just sort of passing the ball back and forth to and from each other. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the beautiful part about being in this band is, is being able to rely on somebody else uh, if you're struggling. And I, and I highly encourage any of you guys out there in bands, um, try your best to be around people that inspire you because that ultimately is what picks you up when you are feeling terrible, which I, hey, I'm the first to tell you, I go through mornings and, and these tough days where I'm just like, damn, I, 
I can't play guitar today, or I'm not feeling anything. I haven't written anything in weeks. Uh, I need something to help, something to pick me up. Um, and the thing that always does it is being around somebody who can impart some sense of inspiration or motivation, uh, whether it's a guitar player or whether it's somebody who's just a good speaker or whether it's somebody like who, who just opens my mind in some way. So, so anyways, I hope that's not uh, too abstract, but just surrounding, surrounding yourself with somebody who sort of can pick you up from being in that hole because I find myself there all the time and that's such an invaluable thing. Um, well, can I take any questions? Yeah. It really depends. It it depends. Uh, he, for those of you who can hear how long it take, how long does it take us to write a song? I mean, Scarlet was written in three and a half hours. Uh, Omega was written over the course of four years. Uh, it just it really depends, and and it, and it is all predicated on sort of how inspiring the in, the initial idea is. Um, Scarlet, it was the tuning. It was the tuning. It was like, wow, this tuning is so cool and fresh and interesting for us. And then we just, we literally we just, we, it just came out without us really intending it for, for it to come out that quickly. But uh, with a song like Omega, a song like Race Car, uh, that stuff just takes time. Uh, and Omega is funny because that song, we had written about a third of it and nobody liked it in the band. <laughs> um, me and Misha had written the first one third of Omega. And uh, we had Nolly's riff in there too. And nobody in the band liked it. So we're like, okay, well, in periphery, if it's a democracy. So if, if not everyone likes the song, then it's not going to be a periphery song. It has to pass this ridiculous quality control process where these six very opinionated dudes who can be assholes, um, you know, they have to, can I say that on this? Okay. Um, but um, it sort of has to pass all the, these checks and balances. Uh, so it just, it just sat in what I call the riff graveyard for for a couple of years. And you should see the periphery riff graveyard because it's gnarly. Um, and there's some crazy stuff in there too. But but things that just didn't necessarily fit what we were doing. Um, but no, I mean, seriously, on my hard drive at home, on Misha's hard drive, on all of, on all of our emails, I, one day I want to like actually compile a list of all the demos and riffs and song ideas that just scrapped for whatever reason. Um, but... Um, I totally forgot what your question was. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it takes a while. Yeah. Did you write the music first and then the later come later? Or did you come up with the and have music back? No, I mean, we always like to mix up the way we write songs. Sometimes we'll start with a drum idea. 80% of the time it starts with a guitar riff because we're just a guitar centric band. Um, but I have to say, the one thing that we've never done is write a song vocals first. Um, I know, no, we didn't even do that on Clear. There was, okay, so the song Alpha, no, was it Alpha? No, there was one song that started with a chorus, Spencer's chorus. He, he was just like, hey, check out this chorus I wrote. And we're like, let's write a song around that chorus. Um, if I think of the song in the next 45 minutes to 60 minutes, I'll tell you. Um, but no, I mean, for us, the, vo the vocals always come pretty much last. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing that we've learned over the years is as guitar players, because me, Misha, and Jake are sort of, that's where the initial songs start with the guitar players, in a room together, bouncing riffs off of one another. Um, we've learned to work Spencer into that process as well. Because if we don't, what ends up happening is him getting a six and a half minute long song uh, where there's no verse, there's no chorus, there's no bridge, there's no space for vocals because we just put 10,000 layers on everything. Um, and that's a big thing, you know? It's like, it's not a good feeling as a singer, and I'm not a singer, but I can only put myself in, in his or her shoes, but to get a demo where there's a layer over every single part, it's like, where, what note am I, what clever choice of notes am I supposed to carve out for myself if you've already taken up all 12 notes in this section? Um, so, so for us, it's, it's, it's such a vital thing to work Spencer into the process. Um, but yes, they, they always do come last. Yeah. Uh, real quick before we continue, if you do have a question, uh, please allow me to pass the mic to you so that um, people watching the stream from home can also hear your question. Um, a 
do you have any specific tips for um, having a good clean tone? Um, no, I mean, I guess if you want to go back to where it starts is your pickups. You want those to be as clear as possible. But really, when you say clean tone, that can be so many things. Um, like if it's heavily affected, if you want a lot of effects on it, um, obviously what kind of effects processor you have, what kind of pedals you're running. But no, if you want a, if you want a good clean tone, I would say it just starts with the having a good guitar. It's really hard to have a passable clean tone with a terrible guitar. Uh, and I tried for years to make it work. I, I used to have like a, a cheap guitar. I put really expensive pickups in there and it still wouldn't help with the, cl the clean tone is that one thing where it's just naked, right? You can hide behind all this gain that I'm using because it's just, it's so much, it's so saturated. But when it comes to a clean tone, that's about as naked as you'll ever hear a guitar. So you really wanna make sure that you have the gear in place if you're gonna play sort of that naked. <laughs> um, but uh, no, if you're using a bunch of effects, that sort of diminishes what I'm just talking about right now. Yeah. Uh, hey, Mark. Mm -hmm. First of all, very nice to meet you, man. Yeah, That's likewise. awesome. And my question was that I recently saw a video that you guys played an, an instrumental set. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you how you felt playing all of the set instrumental, no Spencer on it. Yeah, so he's referring to a set that we played in uh, Hong Kong uh, three months ago, uh, four months ago. Um, and Spencer, he had, I think, laryngitis or something, and we were on tour. Um, so he, like, we were said, do we go home? Uh, and then, because I, for one, I don't like playing instrumental. I think a lot of what makes these songs stand out is, is, is the vocals. These songs are written for vocals, in my opinions, in my opinion. And when we go back to what we were talking about, when the gentleman up here was asking me questions, these are songs, right? And in my opinion, songs should be led by vocals uh, with everything else sort of supporting uh, that. And when Spencer said he didn't want to play, or because <laughs> his throat was swollen. He couldn't play, he really couldn't. He couldn't get up there and sing. He couldn't even talk. Um, he was full of medication, full of steroids to like get the swelling down. Um, we went and just played the show anyways. And uh, I mean, it was cool. We, the, the, the crowd in Hong Kong, they were singing every word. Uh, they were, yeah, they were singing everything. But uh, no, it's not something that I like to do. Um, it's just, it's not periphery. You know, periphery is having everything in that mix and having the vocals carry it, but, uh, but no, it, it was a cool one-off, and I've seen the video that you're talking about, and people seem to like the video on YouTube. I've noticed it has all these views, and it's just people who keep begging for, oh, release an instrumental version of Periphery 3. <laughs> release instrumental Juggernaut. It's like, okay, well, there you go. Do you have your YouTube thing you can go back to if you want instrumental Periphery for 60 minutes? Um, so I hope it makes those people happy. Maybe there's some of you people here. No, I mean, which I can understand if you like to hear the guitar louder, if you just want to hear the riffs, that's beautiful. That's awesome. So I'm glad we, we satisfied that side of you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah, who's, oh, sorry, she's got the mic, but we'll get you next, yeah. Uh, actually, can I yeah. up here? Yeah. Um, yeah, So I guess kind of jumping back to all the songwriting talk from earlier, uh, let's say like, um, I have like a bunch of different like song ideas and unfinished songs that I can't seem to find the you know inspiration or whatnot to finish. Mm -hmm. So can you like maybe give some tips for just finishing yeah, those yeah. kind of unfinished things? That's a yeah. I mean that's a multifaceted answer. Uh, um, for me, for me, it always helps to bounce ideas off of others. But rule number one: when I get stuck, you guys. I mean, like, who do you guys? Do people here write their own songs? Try to write. Okay, so a lot of you write your own songs. Um, I'm sure you guys know the feeling of getting stuck and running, running out of ideas. You're like, oh my God, I got one cool part and then one so-so part and then that's it. Where do I go? What do I do? Um, and for me, you know what always helps is drum grooves. It's like, I don't know if you guys program drums. I'm terrible at programming drums. Um, and it doesn't matter because what matters is the feel that you have in mind. So do you have a straight, so if your riff is like this, just as an example. Is it going to be like a four on the floor? Something like that. Or are you going to groove it? Are you going to... So you're having these feels in mind uh, when you are writing a riff um, can sort of help you get a better picture of what the song is going to sound like. So when you get stumped, 
when you're like, oh crap, where do I go? You can sort of let the drums carry what inspires the, the, the inspiration for your next riff. So if that groove is the, the drum beat that you have in mind, that one that I, I just played, um, for the next riff, try programming the drums first that's, that, don't, that don't groove, so speed it up. So instead of dun, 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 try dun, 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 and just program that, that drum beat. Uh, and then try and write over that because what, what comes out of your fingers is probably gonna be different than what you had in mind before over the groove. So letting the sort of direction of whatever drum pattern you have in mind guide what you write. Um, so that's a big one and one that I, I know a lot of guitar players don't like to think about because drums are disgusting and <laughs> all that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, in periphery we never do tempo changes. We don't do a lot of BPM changes. We don't do a lot of sudden key changes. So I guess rule number one for us is not to really overthink too much. Um, if things are coming together in an arrangement, more often than not, we'll just table it. We won't try and force it. Because if you try and force together these two riffs, one is in a different key and the other one's in a different key, or one's in a different tempo, and then you try and mash a different tempo against it, the likelihood of that is it's just gonna sound forced to the listener. And there's nothing worse than being pulled out of a really good song by that feeling. Yeah. Um, I mean, besides, besides what I've already mentioned, you can involve other instruments. Uh, sometimes what inspires me is like it's putting a synth on something, you know, is, is trying out a different instrument, trying out a different element that you hadn't already involved and seeing if that sort of drives you to, uh, to write something additional on top of that. But, but really, it's, it's such a tough question to answer because each song is so personal and, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's. I'm sorry, that's kind of, that's the biggest non-answer ever, but, uh, but uh, you know, it, the biggest thing is just don't force these ideas out. Just, if you have to take a step away from a song and take a step away, just walk away from it for a little bit. Get a different set of ears on it. Or, you know what I do? Okay, I totally forgot this one. <laughs> is, 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 if that song is frustrating you, write something else, and then come back to that one in like a week, you know? So, write something else. Write a country song. Write, write a, not a country song. Actually, don't write a country song. Um, write something that's totally soft. Write something that's more mellow. Um, write something that sounds completely different from that idea you're working on. And then once that's sort of flashed out and you feel good about that, come back to that. Because um, it, it allows you some perspective. Because you're just locked in. You know, you're too locked in. You're like, God, I need something to sort of, you know, widen my comfort zone. So hopefully that works. Yeah. Um, I can take one more question, then I'm going to resume. Yeah, I was going to ask. It's related to what he said as well, songwriting. Uh, peripheral is pretty progressive, I would say, metal. What metal? Um, what would be the main reason why a song would be, or the, the main reason why a song would be shelved, like you said? And uh, how often do you find yourself coming back to that shelf uh, of whatever song you wrote, a riff, and using it for one of your songs? Very often very often we come back to old ideas all the time because and and this goes back to what I was telling this gentleman here is if your idea is not coming together just put it in the just put it in the folder just put it in the the riff graveyard exactly put it <laughs> yes yes um, and then come back to it and you you know what the best thing is is forgetting about that riff or forgetting about that idea because then a year from then or six months from then, when you're trying to write more, you'd be like, oh my God, I wrote this and I don't even remember it. I'm gonna relearn it. And then all of a sudden, it could spark some idea. Um, so it actually happens quite a bit. A, a lot of Periphery 3 uh, songs were, were developed off of pre-existing shelved ideas that for some reason or another just didn't fit the mold of what we were doing two years ago or three years ago. But for some reason now, we have the inspiration and the, and the sort of attitude to finish them as songs. Um, can I play another song for you guys? Yes. Cool. Um. <laughs>
us back to um, back to drop C. And I'm in a coil split pickup position right here. And I remember when I got the first SE prototype of this exact guitar, um, I put it in this coil split position and I was so inspired by the tone that I, it actually inspired the, um, the main riff from the way the news goes. This really lush sort of fat clean sound or clear sounding uh, clean tone. Started with messing around with this chord shape. This chord shape became. I'm just arpeggiating that chord.
very much. Can I get to any questions before I move on? Yeah, I feel like I've neglected the front row. Yeah. Uh, so when you go between the A and the C team, do you have any issues using the A and the C team? No, not really. No, I don't. Yeah, it seems to translate pretty well. Yeah, depending on either tuning. Um, no, but before I before I move on, actually, based on this this topic we were just talking about, this if you get stuck when you're writing a song, if you get stuck, you know you don't know what to come up with next. I have this one thing that I always try and do. If I'm ever feeling like I'm in a creative rut, I'll always try and choose. Um, a chord progression. I'll just, I'll, I'll try and find a chord progression that I like. I'll find four chords. And that was actually how the pre-chorus for The Way the News Goes was written. So I, I chose this uh, chord progression. Check off all those effects, okay. sounds like a pop song, you know? There's nothing metal about that. Um, but the purpose of the exercise is to try and write a very busy, noty riff on top of this progression. And by on top of it, I don't mean like a layer. I'm talking about having a riff that actually incorporates the bass notes. So that's why it sounds like a busy riff. And this is, this is the riff, riff that I'm referring to is... Um, just listen to the bass notes of that, you'll hear that I'm playing exactly this. Those act as sort of guidelines to the riff. So the riff begins, which is just this. And the only reason I wrote this stupid slide was just to get me in the same fretboard register that I need to be in to fret this. The second chord, and that's the only reason. See, songwriting 101, right? I'm a genius. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so. And then here's the third chord. So I'm already in that position. So that's why you hear so much sliding in a lot of my riffs, is because I'm really trying to find a natural way, a natural sounding way, uh, to have it sort of shift registers without sort of alarming the listener, you know? Because uh, I never wanted to be like, well, where'd that come from? Why is that there? Um, so it, it always needs to sound organic, which is why I try to write the chord progression first. You know what I mean? And there's another effect that happens with that too, is writing a riff, writing a really crazy part where you don't know where the destination is, you don't know where it's gonna end up, that's really intimidating. It's daunting, because then you just end up overwriting. You're just, you're just writing this crazy stuff. It's gratuitous. You know, you're just writing for the sake of sounding technical. But I found that if I have these sort of, these positions, these uh, like totem poles, I'm, I'm sort of trying to follow each one of these chords. I know where the next position is going to be. I can feel more confident in writing these noty bits, because I know where my next chord is going to be. Does that make sense? Like as, as long as I end up in the neighborhood of my next chord, I can go crazy. Um, Have a Blast is another good example. Um, and there's a riff. There's a riff in that song that's just, that's kind of nuts. But Um, 
that rips all over the place as well. But if you break it down to what's happening chorally, it's Sounds like a different song, um, and those chords—it's not like a really original chord progression. It's just—it's just a bunch of st stock chords. Um, but what makes the riff interesting is all the sort of stuff happening between the chords, and that riff came by basically connecting the dots. I knew this is where the riff started, so I start here. That's just arpeggiating the first chord. This chord now becomes. The slide puts me in position to fret this one. And the only reason I did this, the only reason I did that st stupid run is because it leaves me in position to fret this, the octave of this note. That's the only reason I wrote that run. And I mean, it, obviously, it sounds cool in the context of the riff, but functionally, that's why it was placed there. So I hope that makes sense. If, if you're having trouble writing a part that sounds noty, you want the intent of the part to be technical. You want the intent of the part to be noty, to be riffy. Uh, try writing a chord progression first and try using each chord as sort of markers. So you're not just aimlessly writing, you're not just writing with no direction. You know where you're gonna end up. Uh, so I hope that makes some semblance of sense to you guys. Uh, can, I, yeah, can I take another question? Yeah, um, you talked earlier about um, starting out playing when you recorded yourself, Yeah, like when you started uh, learning how to play. And um, could you talk about how you started recording yourself and how you got to your tone? Like what you use, maybe some of Early equipment, something yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, what was Soundforge? Is that an old one? I mean, we're talking, it was an old, old DAW. It was not Pro Tools. It was just some old, I just recorded two tracks of myself playing, like, playing these kinds of riffs. <laughs> not that tone. It's Pantera, you know? Uh, and just trying to track two sides, like I knew Dimebag did it, and try and see if I could get it to sound as tight as he did. Um, and that's where a lot of my, my rhythm playing came from, uh, that and, uh, and James Hetfield, because I would always try and replicate these Metallica riffs, just to see. It wasn't a creative exercise whatsoever. I would just record one side of, um, I don't know, the last song on Injustice for All, there's a song called Dyer's Eve. Yeah, Dyer's Eve that has a riff that's like impossible. It was impossible. <laughs> Anyways, so on and so forth. It's a, <laughs> it's a crazy one. Um, but the exercise was just to see if I could get both sides sounding like a real recording. You know, not have one side lag or not have one have one side that speeds up. Um, just to see if I could. Uh, so that's where a lot of just the importance comes in recording yourself. And that's not even touching on the creative side of, of recording yourself. Because if I, if I had never discovered how to sort of document my ideas, uh, and that's what I mean when I say record yourselves. You don't gotta be the next like big time producer or engineer, just know how to document your ideas. Because once you have them recorded, they're never going away. You can build them, you can, you can scrap them if they're no good, but they're documented. It's like a journal. You, you can never have those riffs disappear. Uh, from existence, so um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the origin of, of me recording myself. And I still I still do it. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I, I record all of my ideas, and I'm terrible at recording. But uh, again, it's just just to get the ideas down, you know, just a demo. Cool. Uh, Hello. Oh, this works. Nice. Hey. Hi. Hey. How's yeah. it going? Um, I actually have a two-part question. Sure. Um, is it true you're Filipino? Yes, I am. <laughs> and uh, how'd your Filipino uh, parents take it when you said you're, you're doing uh, music? Because <laughs> I know my parents went. Is there a stereotype that Filipino yeah. people don't like music? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're Filipino. They're, 
Cool. I can't even get a $200 guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, before I answer your question officially, my stepfather and my little brother are here. They're right there. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they're Filipino, too. Yeah. Um, no, but my mom, my mom is Filipino. I'm half Filipino. Um, and... Uh, I, it was never a battle. I, I don't know if it's cultural at all, man. I don't, I they just want really us to go to school. Man. Yeah, <laughs> or that could be it. But I know, I know that there are some parents out there who are like, you know, don't buy that guitar. You're never going to do, you're never going to mount to anything, you know, whatever. But it's too expensive. Oh, what's that? <laughs> too expensive. Yeah, too expensive, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know. I I know that there are parents out there who don't want to encourage their 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 kids to to pursue music. I mean, I wouldn't even call it the way I got started as a pursuit of music. It was just because I liked it. I liked doing that. You know, it's it's like taking up skiing or taking up whatever hobby you have on the side. Except your thing happens to just cost a little bit more money. <laughs> um, so that could be it. But it didn't take any convincing from my side. I mean, I was just I was lucky enough to have supremely supporting parents. Yeah. I was very lucky, no, no, parents that let me believe in, you know, a stupid dream. Yeah. Um, next question, can I take another question? Yeah, you, hey, I'll get to you in a second, yeah. How's it going? So how much theory is involved in you guys' music? Like, or do you just wing it? Any certain keys you guys stick to? Yeah, so we, none of us know any theory. Actually, the last bit of theory we knew walked out the door with Nolly. <laughs> uh, and he he was the guy. He was the, the only theory guy in the band. I mean, I know rhythmic. I know rhythm theory. I, I know you know what thirty second notes are, sixteenth notes, eighth notes, and all that. Um, but I don't know any musical like music music theory. I don't know how to read music. Um, neither do Misha and Jake. Spencer doesn't know either. Um, it's just something that we uh, we've just grown to learn our craft by. I, I grew up playing songs off of the radio. Uh, I grew up reading tablature. I can read tab. I guess that counts a little bit. But in terms of the creation of the music, uh, none of it, none of it is based on theory. Yeah, we do. Yeah, he was saying we have some pretty, um, I guess, specific and odd sounding chords. We know, like, we have our own set of, I guess it's our own version of theory. Right, because theory is just a language. It's you're communicating a language to someone else. When you say to a saxophone player, play F sharp, and then go to E flat or whatever, uh, that's a language. You're communicating a language to him. But in our band, we have our own language, right? And and we can we almost don't have to speak to each other in some senses. Like when I hear Misha or Jake doing some cool chord that leads into the next part, I know what that so I know that sounds great. Uh, and we all sort of just happen to have the same taste and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we have our own version of theory, and we've been listening to music. I mean, I'm 34 years old. I've been listening to music since I was, a, you know, since I was four or five. So it's just your ears get trained over time, and that's the one thing. Whether you have a theory background or not, um, your ears get trained, depending on how hard you work on your craft over the years. And, again, that just goes back to immersing yourself. Practice, practice, practice. Some kid came up to me yesterday and he was like, how did you get good? Uh, and I was like, well, I, I was just like, I'm, I don't consider myself that good of a guitar player. I, I'm very specific at what I do and I do that. I just immerse myself in that. But I just wanted to grab him, like pick him up and be like, just practice. <laughs> Turn off your phone, put it in airplane mode, put it in the next room uh, and just practice. Just practice. Spend time with your instrument. Uh, that's it. One of those weekends, you get a three-day weekend, instead of hanging out with your friends, just tell them, sorry, I got stuff to do, and then work on music. Just practice. Because that's one thing. You're never going to get anywhere if you don't practice on your craft, and that's just such an underrated thing. And I feel it sometimes, too, because I play with my phone too much, and I'm always like, I, I need to just get away from this thing. And so lately, I've been just trying to put my phone in airplane mode and just work on what I really care about. And, uh, and we all lose sight of that from time to time because of distractions like this or because of whatever other stuff you may be facing in your life. So, so yeah. Um, can I take another? You, I've been ignoring you for like yeah. 10 minutes. Okay. Um, 
Great. How does a periphery, like creative process, compare to the Haunted Shores creative process? And um, do any of the riffs from the Riff Graveyard end up on uh, Haunted Shores riffs? Yeah, a ton. Um, so Haunted Shores is my other side project, aside from Periphery. And to write and generate music for that is so easy because there's no uh, quality control. It's just, it's just me and Misha writing and laughing and like programming blast beats insanely fast and then writing to those. It's, it's super organic and it's fun and there's no filter to it. Whereas Periphery is, periphery is the exact opposite of that. Uh, it's a democracy and it's full of five very opinionated, uh, headstrong people who will voice their displeasure at a song or voice their displeasure at a lyric or a riff or whatever. Uh, and that's just how it goes in Periphery. That's why it takes us half a year to do a Periphery album because it's, it's just a complex band, but one that without all of those factors in place, it, it just wouldn't sound the same. And it's a beautiful thing. It's just a complicated machine. Whereas, whereas Haunted Shores is just, let's have fun. Let's just, let's program, let's program really fast drums and then let's just write crazy music. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um. So one of the things I've done over the years is when I hit a creative rut, I'll throw my guitar into this random tuning. And this is one that I've known for a while now. This is one of my go-to. This is a drop, this is open C add nine. So it's just an open C chord with a ninth on top. See, I know a little bit of theory. Drop C, or open C, add nine, I should say. Um, 
I have one more song to play for you guys, and uh, and then I'm going to get out of here. But I'm going to be hanging around for a little bit, so if you guys want to come say hi, if you guys want stuff signed, if you want to take pictures, it's just whatever, just hang out for a bit. I'm in no hurry to get out. So uh, don't be a stranger after I play this last song. Um, but again, I just wanted to thank Pipple Audio. I want to thank PRS Guitars. Can we give them a round of applause? And thank you guys for, for spending your, your Friday nights hanging out with me talking about string gauges and, <laughs> and nerdy guitar stuff. Um, all right. Here's the, here's the last song for you guys.
Thank you guys for coming once again. And uh, yeah, don't be a stranger. I'll be hanging out for a little bit.